We're missing one. We're uh, still missing a member of the Jacobs team. <clears throat> uh oh. I think there's some difficulty getting into Zoom. That that never happens, like, right? Like I've been saying, you know, I think we should look for a new one, like mm. Teams or WebEx, because I think Zoom has got some limitations. I, I will say I've had a lot of experience with both of those two, and and I and I found Zoom to be actually more reliable. So somebody oh, somebody me. somebody asked somebody else, you know, like what really works because it, it it it's I'm surprised that we. I mean, it, all of them have problems. It seems like, but I find that most people have landed to Zoom because it's less so. Yeah, Teams is is much right. more challenging, and it's got lower. Um, it's just got less um, functionality. Right. So you'll you'll see uh, Jim Lazier's logging in as Paul Cellier. I haven't completely changed overnight. It's not the stress of the job. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand even what you're saying. Right. right. Um, <clears throat> okay. Well, with, without further ado, uh, if it's okay with President Russell, we'll, we'll, we'll get going. Well, I don't know. <laughs> of course it's okay. Great. Um, thank you. Um, welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have a roll call. So if we want to ah. allow Sharice to indulge in that. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Thanks. Um, Director Bregman. Here. Director Gibson. Here. Director Kohler. Here. Director Schmidt. Here. And President Russell. Here. Here. Good to go. Did you hear me? Here. Okay, we're we're good to go. My legal counsel has advised us we're off off and running. Um, good evening, Paul Paul Cellier, Water Resources Director. Um, welcome to the the. I think this is. Board working session number five. Yeah, uh, working session, I think we're calling it, shortening it now to workshop. Everybody's getting a little bit tired of too many words, too many Zoom meetings. Um, but our focus tonight is on water supply options. Um, I, I do wanna recognize some of the comments that we heard at the last um, uh, working session. You know, we, we recognize that this is a complex subject and, and project that we're working on, and we are moving very quickly. Um, but I, I, we're not yet at the point where we're we're asking for decisions to be made. And I, I do want to assure the board and you know interested stakeholders that we will continue to schedule meetings um, and and discuss the topics and the the issues of concern until the questions, all the questions have been answered. And, um, and, and further that, you know, any critical assumptions that we were making along the way and the facts that we need to make decisions that you'll need to make decisions are understood and clear, as well as the implications of, of those assumptions and facts. So, um, and, and you'll note that our schedule goes through August and we, we, we could have, projected further out, but we want to make sure that we don't prescribe, you know, meetings um, ahead of time, as it were. So we want to make sure that there is plenty of opportunity for the discussion, the questions, and the facts to kind of be laid bare. Um, so with that, so, so far, we've, we've looked at demand, we've developed hydrology and a model to help us evaluate uh, some of these water supply options that we'll be talking about tonight. Um, and we use the model and, and, and that demand and hydrology to evaluate the baseline for the water system. And by that, right, that's just the existing water supplies with um, kind of normal conservation measures, no drastic measures employed. And what we saw was that under a certain range of circumstances, certain future hydrologies, the, the water system would experience water supply deficits. And so now this evening, this is our sort of initial look at water supply options that can maybe help us to, um, to, to, to change those deficits, right? Um, and it's, this isn't the goal for tonight. This is sort of the big picture overview. So we're gonna to try to touch on all of the main water supply options, including costs. Uh, and, and again, you're seeing these costs 
uh, get hot off of the presses. And so you, you'll see draft plastered all over the place. But these are, these are you know, engineered estimates. Um, and while we'll continue to refine them, they're going to be useful for us tonight to just get an understanding of the range of the costs that we're looking at and the relative comparison to other water supply options. So uh, with that in mind, tonight's big picture will be presented by our team from Jacobs um, with uh, Jim Lazier uh, talking to us about the desalination options and Rujiro Sushihashi from Jacobs as well will be talking to us about the recycled water options. Um, and Marcelo, uh, I think, will be talking to us about local storage as well as uh, Armin Munavar, uh, who uh, will be, will be uh, picking up the other items tonight. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Armin to get us started. And while he's pulling up his presentation, I'll just note we do have a lot of slides tonight, and um, we're going to get through the first dozen or so very quickly. We're just a catch up for folks that may not have participated to this point. Okay, thanks, Paul, and um, good evening. Um, yeah, Armin Manever and the, uh, my team will be supporting me here today to talk about the water supply alternatives. Just a brief, everyone see the slides okay before I, yeah, okay, great, thanks. Um, just a, a brief overview of what we intend to discuss today. Um, very brief on the project update. Um, do want to spend a little bit of time on assumptions and estimates of what are the basis for some of our assumptions, limitations. Um, and then, as Paul mentioned, it's really an overview of the water management alternatives. Um, and we have subsequent um, meetings over the next uh, several weeks to do deeper dives in each of those alternatives. Then we'll kind of wrap up. Uh, here's where we are today with uh, Paul, I think shared this with, with you um, last week, our schedule for, for providing information and having discussions around the strategic water supply assessment. Today is this initial review of the water management options. And then just a, a preview of the next two um, workshop dates that we have set July 12th, where we'll do a uh, deeper dive in desalination and recycled water and answer your questions a little bit um, in more detail. And then July 19th, we'll look at Interties Local Supply and, and the Sonoma Marin Partnership Opportunities. Uh, then as we get into August, we'll be looking at, okay, now we'll be saying, okay, here are the, the water management options. How do we evaluate them? Which ones are better under certain criteria? Which ones or struggle a bit and, and how might we get towards um, really a, a roadmap for implementation. So that's the cadence we're working at from, uh, from a briefing of the board and the public. Uh, just a reminder, we're, we're looking at building upon past work. We're looking for a comparative analysis of water supply options and really to develop a recommendation of, on a strategic water roadmap. Uh, we fully believe, certainly as we go more and more into this, that a portfolio approach is likely to be um, a recommendation where we'll be looking at various um, water supply and, and demand management alternatives that would be combined to achieving resilience for the system. We, I'm going through these fairly quick, so I'm happy to slow down if need be, but we presented this to you in the past. Just a reminder, we're like as Paul mentioned, we're looking at what are the current risks to, to the district's delivery reliability under projected and future droughts. Last meeting, we, we shared with you the magnitude of some of the deficits under some very severe scenarios. Um, and then we're, we're at this point of what is the range of water supply alternatives that could um, increase the resilience of the system. And then as we get into recommendations is really, or into evaluation is where we'll identify more of the strengths and weaknesses associated with them. Hey, Armin, before you go further, um, I'd like to um, just touch on number two, because it maybe it can be factored into how we talk about um, things uh, later on this evening. 
Um, I was thinking back to the presentation that, that you did, uh, whatever, two weeks ago, um, where you guys started coming up with some volumetric estimates of, of our supply deficit under different scenarios. And, um, and those numbers, I think, um, are um, present a, a, a very maybe precise volume number that we might need some help crosswalking over to these alternatives. So when you come up, if you just say like, come up with a number that says 6,000 acre feet provides, is the volume of water we are short in order to have the weather through three successive dry years. When we think about how much, you know, uh, you know, groundwater banking or conservation or desal or, you know, pipeline across the bridge, whatever the project might be, the volume that crosswalks to that need. So I, I, I'm sure I see you nodding. So I wonder if that makes sense. But I know that a lot of folks have, have thought about our problem in the context of how many years of storage we have. So you know, we, this notion that modern urban water districts have, you know, between three and four years of supply. How do we, how do we take that in, you know, how do we look at the volume you're talking about and crosswalk that to that type of, of way of looking at volume of water supply for resilience and security? Yeah, really good, good question and observation. I, those numbers that we presented previously, which were kind of on the order of um, if I remember them correctly, somewhere between four and eight, eight thousand, eight, eight, yeah, four and eight thousand acre feet per year of of deficit under those dry years. What we're really looking at is okay, what are the opportunities of taking some of these alternatives to help bridge that gap? Um, the water supply that might be generated from these alternatives doesn't have to happen exactly in the same time as those deficits are occurring. It could be supply that's built up in preceding years to a drought so it's so it's definitely a, it's a crosswalk as you said but it's not necessarily we're trying to fill the bucket simultaneously as the deficit is occurring ideally we're we're being proactive and building building supply and storage capabilities in advance i think that that's i i hear what you're saying i'm not sure that that is speaking to the question that i i i have which is maybe another way to put it is when it wouldn't be unreasonable for for some of our you know customers who are trying to understand the problem to see your analysis between six and eight thousand acre feet and go wow we only need another like quarter of our annual um, uh, uh, average consumption and and you know and I know that that's not that wouldn't be the correct way to interpret that but does that help you to understand like how do we? How will we look at at developing that six to eight thousand acre feet in the context of you know what might you know for 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 water supply surface water supply uh, storage you know you don't you wouldn't just build eight thousand acre feet of additional you know reservoir space it takes like something bigger fifteen thousand acre feet or something like that to generate reliably that eight so anyway I just I, I hope that. I think that we're going to need some help figuring out how to take that precise number and applying it correctly to these different other alternatives. Yeah, yeah, I, I do understand your question now. Okay. Um, Thank you. I think the storage doesn't equal supply. That's a key, mm -hmm. key component right there. That um, so when we're when we are looking at augmenting storage, unless you have water to fill the storage, it's it, it's meaningless. So so building that that analysis in part of what we're showing today will be kind of setting up these alternatives. There's an analysis that needs to occur following this where we'll actually um, test out some of these options in the model and see if they actually provide the, the deficit reducing uh, yield that we actually think they can provide. So. Great, thank you. I, I hope I'll answer your questions as we go through. I know you're not probably fully satisfied with that one, but we'll, I hopefully we'll get there before the end. Okay, well, just as a as a kind of process check on where we where we are, we've we've talked a little, um, about strategy and goals. We're starting to develop metrics. We we showed some of those metrics um, in the past work. We've done a lot of work on the decision support model, um, and our team's been 
really kind of building in refined operating criteria of, of all the marine systems and the imported uh, water systems. We've looked at the demand scenarios and we're really at this, at this initial phase of developing the water supply alternatives. Um, so that's where we are today. And then we'll be heading into the latter part of July and August, looking at evaluation and eventually getting to a roadmap. So just as a, as a big picture uh, concept setting here is we're really looking at, looking at some of those deficits and the, the um, resilience challenge that, that exists and, and looking at what could be done to, to make the system more resilient. And so we're looking at a broad range of water management alternatives. We eventually want to identify the most promising alternatives, but right now we're at the, kind of this top phase of looking at what are the, the potential opportunities. We'll be going through a process of applying evaluation criteria to each of those um, alternatives, and then eventually building what we think will be strategic portfolios of actions that might involve different actions and different timing of those actions uh, to, to lead towards a roadmap. That's kind of the, that's the big, the big picture. Uh, today, we're going to talk about um, various water management alternatives. We'll, we'll, um, the baseline is what we presented last, last time, kind of the, the do nothing alternative, if you will, or the um, kind of setting the stage for the problem. We'll look at desalination opportunities, uh, recycled water, local surface storage enhancements, uh, Sonoma Marine partnerships, and water purchases through um, conveyance with the Bay Inner Ties. Uh, we, today, we won't have the drought conservation discussion. We're gonna look at the supply alternatives today, but we'll be sure to bring that, bring that back at the subsequent meetings. So a couple of uh, caveats and understanding on the assumptions we're making. So uh, when you see the water management alternatives we're, we'll be working through, uh, it's good to understand kind of the level of development of those alternatives. Um, we've reviewed previous um, water supply assessments for the district. We've looked at various elements of those assessments and have update, um, updated those based on our team's uh, related experience. Uh, we've done high level technical evaluation of the alternatives and we've done kind of high level uh, conveyance uh, needs and concept level routing and sizing of various uh, pipelines and infrastructure. Uh, for some of the alternatives, we've done some preliminary modeling that's supported the yield estimation. I would say um, by and large, there's additional modeling that would have to occur on, on most of these. So the the yield estimates that we'll talk about today are expressed as, as new supply, expressed in acre feet per year of new supply. Um, as we work through this, operational changes will be needed in order to integrate and optimize those supplies. And that's really what the model helps us out quite a bit with. Um, like Director Schmidt just mentioned, how do we, you know, 10,000 acre feet of storage capacity doesn't equal 10,000 acre feet of new supply. So how do, what, um, what yield does that actually produce in the drought years that we're trying to, trying to evaluate? Uh, and so that's the last part is that we're, we're doing continued modeling on, on the, how these yields translate into drought benefit. Uh, the cost, we'll be presenting some cost assumption or cost estimates today. Uh, they're all what we would consider class five cost estimates, which are concept level cost estimates. They have a, a fairly high, high range of uncertainty around them. Um, and really, it's like Paul and I have talked about there, it's not the, the, um, the market value of the, of the project that's really important here, but is the relative cost comparison of the alternatives. Uh, we have, um, we'll show some cap, we'll show capital costs and annual O&M costs, and then express those into dollars per acre foot. Uh, we've used kind of high level assumptions of 30 year, uh, 30 year project um, planning period with the 3% interest rate and common, common assumptions doing, uh, used for cost estimating. Uh, finally, there's three levels of cost estimating approaches that are included. We've kind of at the, 
top end is we've done some independent evaluation using Jacob's cost estimating tools and say primarily for the desalination and some of the reuse um, options we've we've used this and some of the conveyance aspects as well. Uh, the second level of cost estimating is we've used previous cost estimate or cost estimates from other studies and we've escalated all of those to reflect essentially May of 2022 cost assumptions. And then finally, the, we have some costs from comparable related projects where we're using those, those costs as reflective of the type of costs we would expect for the option, but they're not as detailed as the, the previous two. All the costs that we'll show today should be considered draft and certainly will be updated. So I can't stress that enough. I know people like numbers and tend to run with numbers. So that caveat is um, on a, every one of our cost slides. So, so with that, I'm gonna um, hand it off to Jim Logier, who's gonna walk us through the desalination options. And then we'll get into reuse options following that. Thanks, Armin. Take it away. Progress to the next slide, please. So under desalination, we have four options that were being considered here as part of this evaluation. And I'll go through those. The first is the Marin Regional Desalination Facility. The second, a containerized and potentially released desalination facility. The third is the Bay Area Regional Desalination Facility. And then fourth, and the fourth one, we're not going to spend as much time on um, involving Petaluma Brackish Regional Desalination. Next slide. So what we're calling here desalination option one, the Marin Regional Desalination Facility, and this is one that's been carried forward since the 2006-2007 pilot study. Um, this would be a permanent facility located at the Pelican Way storage site. Uh, the intake pump station will be in the bay and shown on the, uh, the blue line there on the, on the white graphic. Um, and that intake station will be located on an old piece of property just north of the Pelican Way site. This would be a 5 MGD capacity facility able to be expanded to 10 or 15 MGD. And that's how we've costed this out as a 5 MGD expandable as we go through that. Treated water from this facility would be introduced in the existing distribution system in a similar way that was done uh, for the intertop project. Uh, the treatment process, I won't go through this, but it's a basic seawater desalination process um, with pretreatment, um, a two pass RO system, and potentially just one pass, depending upon how we approach the design, um, post treatment of that permeate from the RO system to make the water compatible with the distribution system and be disinfected. Um, and then residuals from primarily the pretreatment system would be uh, handled and disposed of offsite. The brine from the RO process would be discharged into the CMSA outfall. And there are a number of considerations around this, uh, this option, obviously having to do with permitting primarily. Um, but there's also the aspect of how you would operate this facility given the fact that you may not want to produce water from the facility all the time and that would become part of the ONM strategy. Next slide. So option two, the containerized desalination facility is kind of an outgrowth of the emergency desalination option we looked at last year um, in parallel with the uh, pipe over the bridge. And this essentially is taking um, containerized equipment that could provide up to 5.4 MGD of capacity using three uh, individual systems that would be integrated together. Uh, they could be either leased or purchased, uh, depending upon what approach would make sense. There are a number of providers of this type of equipment. We basically developed this around a company who provides this equipment out of Australia called Osmoflow. Treatment process very similar to the permanent facility, uh, really nothing different there. Um, again, the brine. And in this case, the backwash from the pretreatment will be discharged in the CMSA outfall. Um, again, similar considerations around permitting. Um, and again, around on end as well. At this point, we're not to be operating continuously. One of the key considerations also would be really equipment availability. Um, is it available when you want it, or would you have to plan in advance and have the equipment be actually manufactured uh, for use at the site? 
Next slide. So option three, the Bay Area Regional Desalination Facility. This would be a facility that would be located up at Contra Costa Water District's Mallard Slough site, which is shown in that right graphic uh, with the star. Uh, obviously, this project has been ongoing for a number of years. You see the partners would be considered as part of this project listed here on the slide. This facility would be 20 million gallons a day capacity. And as part of our evaluation, we just made the assumption that 5MG that capacity would be made available to Marin Municipal Water District. That water be, would be conveyed down to the Pelican Way site and the, or the conveyance system to be the option to be decided. Um, but it would be then put, water would be stored at Pelican Way and then distributed just like the other previous desalination options I showed. Similar desalination process, except we're treating the brackish water, not seawater or bay water. So it'll be a little, little bit different design with a little more recovery of the water from the uh, slough here, which reduces the cost of the treatment system. Brine discharge, based on what's been uh, done to date with this particular project, has not been decided, but there are two wastewater treatment facilities up there I show here in this bullet. Uh, in which case the brine could go either one of those outfalls that are nearby to the, uh, the location of the site. Again, similar considerations, not as many uh, issues around permitting here at this facility, particularly as it pertains to Marin's permitting requirements. Uh, but there would obviously be discussions around the availability of water from this particular project at a given time, depending upon uh, what the other partners are needing as well under a drought scenario. Next slide. So we're not covering the, uh, the desalination floor at this point, but it would be a, an option around the Petaluma Brackish desalination facility. We can spend more time on it if we need to. But here we have the cost summary. And so we're listing the capital cost, annual O&M cost, total annualized cost for those three options, as well as the yield. Uh, those yields re reflect for the first uh, option, 1A, 1B, 1C, and that's equivalent to 5, 10, and 15 MGD of capacity from the treatment plant, and then 5.4 MGD for option two, and 5 for option three. And then obviously the cost per acre foot listed here uh, for the three options. Note that for option two, the cost per acre foot is very high because we just basically annualize that cost over a five year or the capital cost over a five year period, as opposed to the other options, which we annualize the capital cost over 30 years. So that's why that number is, is much higher. So that concludes the slides on the sound option. options. And, and why did you do that? Well, we assume that the containerized system, unlike a permanent facility, would not be something that you would want to have for 30 years. Um, given that it's, it's not really a permanent desalination facility. So we just made that assumption. It's a bit arbitrary and that can be adjusted, um, but that's how we approach that option. Yeah, I mean, your, your whole uh, dollar scraper foot running higher than anything we've seen before. Yes, good point. Across the board. Yes, and this reflects a couple of things. First of all, obviously costs for a lot of the equipment have gone up because of COVID. Um, and in addition, we've adjusted some of the percentages on the non-construction costs, again, to reflect what's happening with COVID. And those cost percentages were adjusted based upon some detailed conversations with our actual cost estimators uh, in Reading. So we, we actually did a deep dive on those percentages. And obviously when percentage costs goes up, that's gonna raise the price of the overall project uh, above and beyond what we've seen increases in some of the uh, the capital cost aspects, such as the desalination equipment. In addition, for option one, costs we had included previously for the conveyance system to move the water from Pelican Way into the Marin distribution system um, has changed and has gone up considerably. So that's another increase of the cost of the, called the capital for the construction side of the equipment. We can dive into that more detail later on, but I don't want to slow us down too Thanks. Much. What, uh, uh, you may have mentioned it, but I missed it. If you did, wh why are we not going into more detail on the Petaluma 
Uh, yeah, I can jump in on, on that one, Director Gibson. Uh, we're still building out the concept on the Petaluma Brackish D cell. I'll share with you what we know at this point, but we're still building that out. It's It's been a kind of a, a high priority item from lots of discussions, but very little has been done on building out what actual concept. So what we have as assumptions right now is roughly a 3.6 MGD brackish groundwater desalter um, in Petaluma. Uh, the, the complexity that we're working through is where would the brine be discharged back to Petaluma River or through one of the outfalls. And we didn't want to share the cost information or those assumptions until we build that out a little bit further. Okay. But we think the costs will be in the range that, that are shown here on the, on the far right. Okay, thank you. And the flow, where did you get that number? Is it hydraulic based or it's just a, a number? It's a, a supply base that was perceived at the time to be available of brackish water to be confirmed still as well. But what I'm asking Armin, is it uh, hydro hydrogeological or it's just a number? Is there um, actually a basis for it or it's just a uh, rubber tummy? It was, there's a basis for it being available and then we've assumed a certain number of, of wells that could be uh, produced a 3.6. And what I've listed here is, is two MGD out of the 3.6. So it's both hydrologically based and then an assumption of kind of available infrastructure to, to work with. Cool. But I, must, but I must, I'll just to caveat this, I, I, I know this is uh, a project of great interest, but very little has been done. So we're kind of working from a total blank slate. And we, before we push anything out there, we wanted to confirm our assumptions. So that's why it has been in progress box. Armin, this is Larry Bragman. So um, as far as the contrast between option 1A and option 2, um, is there any, any um, operating data that shows that the containerized system has a limited uh, lifespan? Jim, maybe you want to jump in. Yeah. Obviously, the containerized, if you were to buy the system brand new, and not lease it as an existing system. Obviously, the life of the crew would be longer. Um, How much longer? What What's the anticipated uh, operating? Um, yeah, I would say probably the leased equipment, uh, based upon the designs I've seen, could probably go for 15 years without so, major without major maintenance. Obviously, the equipment is inside containers. It's a little bit more difficult and more costly to maintain um, when you're talking about equipment inside of containers, but um, that would be my, my assumption at this point without a little more detailed discussions with the actual suppliers um, in terms of how they've kind of, how they priced out according to the life of the equipment from their end, from a leasing standpoint. So if we, if we increase the life of the containerized version of a desal facility, wouldn't that cut the annualized cost considerably? It would, but what I have not done here in terms of the, the uh, O&M cost is I have not included replacement for membranes, uh -huh. which becomes significant both on the pretreatment side and the RO side, because at five years, we assume those membranes will last five years. We get beyond five years, I have to add in that equipment cost from a, a replacement cost to the uh, O&M cost. So there's a trade-off between Dividing by, uh, by, by a bigger number, but not including the costs that are going to go into that number on the point M side. But we can, we can do that. That's a simple calculation. But wouldn't you have to, wouldn't you have to replace the filters as uh, on that basis with a permanent facility? Yes, and those are built into that, the, the annual O&M cost. I see, but they were not built into the container, I suppose. They weren't built in because five yeah. years is what we had. Okay, and then as far as um, Contra Costa, that, that's the Bay Area desal facility. Yeah, or Barda, right, Barda, as they called it, yes. Okay, and so what stage is that with our sister agency's planning process? I mean, how far has it gotten? I have not seen any publications, uh, Director Bragman, on that. 
The only thing I've seen recently is that uh, SFPUC included in one of their documents or planning documents accessing up to as much as 15 MGD of water from that facility. But I've not seen anything published since they did a environmental assessment of the brine discharge and the intake. So um, nothing publicly available has been, has been really developed on that project or published in that project several years. And so wouldn't that indicate to you a, a, a fairly low level of interest uh, by those other agencies in participating in that project or going forward with the project? That's a fair question. Um, I guess that's something we'd have to follow up with one or more of the agencies and, and get a take their temperature, so to speak, and where that is. Well, you know, one of the things that occurs to me is Contra Costa has indicated it's got excess capacity at one of its existing reservoirs, which leads me to believe that they would have a pretty low level of interest in investing the kind of money that's indicated here for a desal or desalter. Yeah, Director and, Bragg. Oh, yeah, and then the other thing is, are, are, aren't those agencies um, planning to construct the site's reservoir, which would also increase storage and decrease interest in a Bay Area desal facility? Carmen, I'll defer yeah. that. Yeah, and th those all could very well be be true, Director Bragman. What what we're trying to do today is just lay out what the alternative is, and then when we get to the evaluation criteria, we have we have certain specific criteria that identify the jurisdiction who's involved, how complex is it to actually implement. So I think we'll we'll tackle those sorts of issues in in kind of the latter latter phase. But you're okay. absolutely, you're absolutely correct. I mean. We're putting them all on an equal playing field at this point, but we know they're not. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess uh, that's a little unfair. I'm jumping ahead. So um, I will um, sit down again. And <laughs> let me it seems to me that your five years may be a little optimistic as well. Are you assuming the thing is only running part of the time? Or is it running full time? Well, that's, that's a discussion that uh, Paul and I have had about really what is the right approach for the operation of a desal facility that's there primarily for drought mitigation, right? And you can assume that it's offline and being preserved, so quote unquote, um, or you can run it at some lower capacity. Um, we haven't really made any decisions. And I think that as Armin's referred to, that will go into this evaluation, uh, not only for this option, for option one, in terms of how we factor in the actual operating cost of that facility, depending upon how the district wants to run that um, once a facility were to be built. Well, it's a pretty deep swallow at 356 million regardless. I will not disagree with that. And one other question, and I'm sure you probably know the answer. What is the elevation at Pelican as far as how this would, um, withstand sea level rise? I do not know without looking at a... Um... It, it, it's maybe 20 feet. Okay. And we haven't, we haven't got to that level of kind of vulnerabilities associated with the you know, climate impacts and sea level rise. But it's interesting, the target that's there and the Home Depot do not have a defensive um, Wall. berms, but the uh, El Pollo Loco, which is about half a mile away, does have them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's just a difference in the date they were constructed or if there's that the El Pollo Loco is lower than um, the El Pollo Loco is more at the elevation of the CSMA plant, which could be a little lower than where we're talking about. Pollo Loco has probably got a higher priority, doesn't it? That's a criticality factor. Criticality factor. I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, maybe, yeah, I mean, uh, in a humorous sense. Um, you know, there's also a difference with the restaurant. Uh, flood is fairly catastrophic in a retail box store. You know, it's, it's a problem, but it's not as that the health issues aren't there, huh? cleanup. So there may be maybe some other reason going on. I think I'm going to, if 
there aren't more questions, I'm gonna keep us moving. Uh, just a reminder, there will be opportunity to do a deep dive on desal and reuse at the next workshop. So we've got quite a few options to go through. So I'm gonna keep us going if you don't mind. Um, my partner in crime here is gonna, Rujiro Sushihashi is gonna walk through the water reuse options that we explored. Thank you, Amin. Uh, can you hear you? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I will describe uh, the uh, go through uh, four of the uh, water reuse options. One is the uh, non portable uh, uh, reuse expansion, uh, one is the uh, indirect portable reuse, and the uh, third one is the uh, environmental release or in lieu um, stream flow um, to the uh, um, <coughs> Uh, Lagunitas Creek, essentially. Um, and the last one is the yeah, direct portable reuse. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the uh, first one, uh, non-portable reuse expansion, as you all know, uh, there are already uh, some of the uh, non-portable um, purple pipe uh, reuse systems um, around the area. Um, and I picked two, we picked two uh, particular projects that's been uh, mentioned in previous studies or uh, one actually going on as the, uh, going into the uh, actual construction. One is the uh, uh, Las Galinas Valley's um, recycled water system expansion to uh, send recycled water to Pico Gap Golf Course. Um, that is essentially uh, expanding uh, distribution system and using the uh, recently expanded 5MGD uh, recycled water treatment um, plant as a source of um, recycled water. Um, the second one is the um, mentioned in the uh, supply plan 2040 published in 2017 that is to construct the uh, non-portable uh, disinfected tertiary treatment system uh, at the uh, CMSA and sending that uh, disinfected tertiary water to the uh, San Quentin prison. Um, annual demand for this one is yeah, described as the 154 acre foot per year in the report, um, but a um, cost estimate um, used the yeah, 200 uh, acre foot per year. Uh, so um, you may see a level of disc discrepancy in the uh, a number um, in the slide uh, you will see in the cost, um, but uh, those are the um, approach that was taken in the previous report. So um, for now, we are following the uh, how it was described before. And as we go through the uh, actual evaluation process, I uh, will further refine how we are going to define those projects. Um, some of the considerations, um, the recycled water systems, um, uh, that's the, uh, and the non-portable purple pipe system is a well accepted uh, concept. However, as we all know that um, most of the uh, demand is seasonal. And also, as you see the 166, 154 acre foot per year, that's compared to what the um, gym presented in the uh, diesel option, that's a uh, pretty tiny um, volume. Uh, so, um, how much of a value that can get out of it uh, from um, expanding portal pipe. That is sort of a, um, a question we need to look into as we go further. Next slide, please. The second one is the uh, indirect, indirect portable reuse. Uh, this is the uh, um, borrowing the uh, um, evaluation from again, the uh, two th uh, plan 2040 previous study. Essentially the uh, concept is to collect uh, secondary effluent from three wastewater treatment plants, uh, Las Carinas, um, SAA, SAM, uh, SAM, and the CMSA to the uh, CMSA uh, site and treat it to the uh, purified water level and send it to the uh, Kent Lake. Uh, so this is going to yield uh, about seven MGD or yes, um, close to 8,000 acre foot per year. Um, the treatment process is going to be um, membrane filtration followed by reverse osmosis, followed by advanced oxidation. So it's yeah, 
very involved uh, treatment process. And that is to be discharged to Kent Lake. That is the yeah, current assumption. Um, and the reason why this goes to Kent Lake instead of yeah, Bon Tempe or um, other smaller lakes closer to the uh, water treatment plant is the yeah, dilution factor. Um, if it is yeah, clo much closer and much less um, dilution, it gets essentially the raw water augmentation, direct portable reuse, which I will describe in uh, a few slides later. So the uh, one of the things that um, that we've started finding is the water balance. Um, the Alaska Inas Valley is the, um, doing the seasonal discharge, so it's the um, conservative estimate. But uh, on the drier season, when the Alaska Inas Valley is not discharging to the uh, outfall, uh, the total discharge through those three treatment plants is just over nine MGD um, sometimes. And yet we need to look into the uh, uh, water balance, uh, especially when um, a lot of water conservation comes in and the uh, wastewater flow may go down. Uh, that is something that we will look into in the further evaluation. And as I um, we uh, go to the uh, next slide. Um, in the um, uh, stream flow release, um, that is essentially going to be the same concept as the uh, uh, indirect portable. So um, initially, uh, when we presented the um, this uh, option three, uh, we presented two options. One is to treat uh, recycled water to the disinfected tertiary level and discharge directly into the uh, Lagunitas Creek. Um, the other option is essentially the same as IPR, uh, indirect portable reuse. Uh, so um, make it into the uh, purified water um, IPR level uh, quality and send it to Kent Lake. By sending all the water to Kent Lake, this can be used as either portable water source or the uh, um, creek discharge. Um, as we looked into this option further, it appeared that um, discharging directly into the uh, Lagunitas Creek by doing the uh, tertiary treatment doesn't necessarily, uh, doesn't really make sense in a way. Um, it is the longest pipeline we need to um, construct and a lot of um, uh, energy to pump water up to the uh, Lagunitas Creek and also the um, some of the water quality issues, including temperature, but also nutrient and other um, elements that may prevent simple disinfected tertiary uh, water to go into the uh, creek when the um, uh, current discharge is yeah, from Kent Lake, that's yeah, very high quality water. So um, <clears throat> we'll be folding in, uh, folding in this option into the uh, indirect portable. And next slide, please. The, uh, the last one is the direct portable. Uh, there are two concepts um, here. One is yeah, being studied by uh, CMSA uh, to treat CMSA affluent and send it directly to the uh, distribution system that is called the uh, treated water augmentation. The other concept is to send uh, purified water to the um, uh, nearby lake, uh, the closer lake to the uh, treatment plant. Um, in this case, we are assuming Bontempe Lake uh, to be taken up by Bontempe uh, water treatment plant. Um, for the, uh, uh, the former uh, treated water augmentation concept, uh, we are using the um, uh, recent study that is going to up, going up to 4 MGD. And for the uh, raw water augmentation option, we're assuming uh, similar to IPR option, collecting three treatment plants effluent into the uh, one place and treat it to up to seven MGD of yield. And that this is the uh, by far the most involved treatment process and a lot of uh, monitoring requirement 
And the, um, again, um, similar to IPR, there is going to be a little bit of uh, water balance issue that needs to be considered. And one thing that needs to be uh, mentioned is that there is currently no regulation in place for DPR. Um, the California state is set to um, um, lay out the regulation by December 2023. Uh, however, it doesn't exist as of now. So we are assuming uh, the expected treatment process as the uh, uh, basis for this evaluation. And next, next slide, please. So this is the um, um, preliminary cost estimate summary. Um, the, uh, other than the uh, 4B regional DPR concept um, and other um, numbers are coming with, um, basically from the uh, previous studies and uh, escalating into the uh, current mm -hmm. dollar. And the regional DPR concept, uh, we uh, use the, um, our cost estimating tool. And this is the preliminary number we got. And again, yeah, as uh, Armin and Jem uh, mentioned, uh, this is yeah, still uh, in a preliminary level. And there are probably some of the uh, inconsistency in how the uh, previous studies um, estimated, the, especially the OM cost. And that probably need to be um, adjusted to make it a more apple to apple comparison. Any questions? Uh, so I have a quick question about um, the um, the DPR. Um, as you say, that's been under study for a while. It is a little. It, it is a higher number than I was expecting. That I think we were all expecting on the cost per acre foot. But I appreciate the caveats you've been giving us. Can you maybe unpack for us a little bit why you're seeing the numbers for that option to be a bit higher than some of the preliminary numbers coming out of the CMSA, CMSA uh, studies? Yes, so um, um, the option 4A CMSA DPR study, um, I think yeah, the uh, TM uh, technical memo uh, that was published in March uh, cited, I think yeah, for 4MGD $2,700 per acre foot. That was, I think, yeah, the number for 2MGD, it was in a, a range of yeah, 4,600 or something. And we read the uh, um, report and the, the report mentioned the um, OM cost, what was included in their OM cost. And what we noted was the, uh, the replacement cost for the membrane was not included, at least not mentioned. So uh, we assumed that was not included. And also um, there is the, uh, quite a bit of uh, monitoring uh, testing requirement that is going to be involved in DPR. And that was also not mentioned. And the, um, our cost estimating tool for uh, we use for um, option 4B regional, we already included those um, in the percentage. So um, to be fair with the um, uh, 4B option, and uh, also that the uh, similar approach was taken for diesel cost estimating options. So we upped the uh, OM cost, and that's why it, the dollar number is a little bit higher. In addition to uh, adjusting the uh, data from 2000, uh, one year ago to now, uh, it's like a more than I thought uh, increase in the, uh, the inflation rate uh, in based on the cost index. Right. I also just want to note, because I was able to go through the slides a little bit before your presentation, I really want to thank the Jacobs team for the way that you've been able to um, do these reuse options so clearly. And just to what, just to your point, you know, doing such a good job of making this an apples to apples comparison. So it seems like you've taken a lot of care to do that and to present these in a, um, you know, a very consistent way. So I, I want to thank you for that. That's not always the case. So that's thank great. You. Um, so that's, that's super helpful. Um, the other question I have about the, um, option four, I think you're correct <clears throat> that the regs aren't expected to be finalized for about 18 months. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm interested in what you think about that, because I don't see that as necessarily a practical limitation for us because, you know, the permitting and everything that it would take, 
you know, to get this up and running. That's actually a time frame. Again, I'm not trying to suggest that's where the district would go, but if it did want to go um, in this direction, um, my sense is that that would not be a limiting factor because the pl the preliminary planning and everything that it would take to get there um, would allow for for that and for us to um, accommodate mm -hmm. that time frame, assuming the regs stay on track. I think that is the. Yeah, uh... I agree with that. Um, I think it's much more when, uh, if this uh, DPR option becomes a more of an issue with the timing, then it is going to be more of a public perception, public outreach, and yeah. how yeah. the uh, only recently uh, approved regulations and right. there is no actual installation anywhere else, and how this can be implemented in marine <laughs> and how to approach that, um, that may be more of a time consuming factor than the uh, how to pass that regulation. Uh, hurdle. Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, are you familiar with the extent to which um, similar regs have already been um, adopted in other states and um, whether other facilities of this kind are, um, you know, are underway? Yeah, so the uh, Texas has the, uh, some of the DPR, more of the uh, uh, raw, 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 raw water augmentation type um, already in place. Um, I'm not actually aware of treated water augmentation project in place mm -hmm. as of now. Okay. Brazil, the only project that I think exists in the United States that would be treated water augmentation would be El Paso. So El Paso did a pilot study several years ago and they were moving forward with doing treated water augmentation but I haven't heard much about that project mm. recently. Yeah, that's right. You yeah. know whether or not it's actually is still moving forward or not. It may be a cost issue. It may not be a regulatory issue. But again, the regulations in Texas are very different sure. than they are here in California in terms of what the bar is that you. So they're doing treated or augmentation with only the same basic process that mm. we're doing <clears throat> direct potable or groundwater recharge. So it's a it's a. a for lack of a better word, it's a lower bar to get over in terms yeah. of the regulatory side. That was, that was my understanding. I was just thinking, I just was looking for you to confirm. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a, just a couple questions. On um, the option 1A, which is sort of embedded in the PowerPoint in option 1, 1A is the San Quentin option, isn't it? Correct. So in the PowerPoint, it indicated that San Quentin had a uh, annual um, consumption of 154. Yes, uh, so that's where, the one. Where is the additional uh, use? Yeah, um, and I, I'm trying to uh, find out about that as well. Um, I used the 200 in here. Uh, um, Basically, because the, uh, the uh, previous report used the uh, 200 as the uh, basis to com uh, do the uh, come up with the uh, cost per acre foot, um, it could be the uh, uh, more um, op optimistic demand. Uh, so the actual demand assessment might have um, only been 154, but um, it could be uh, consumed up to 200. That may be the um, uh, assumption. But um, yeah. as we go through uh, in detail and actual uh, reality check, uh, this number on the yield part may need to be adjusted. Yeah, Thank yeah, and I, I didn't mean to, to nitpick on it. I'm just also, this is a question for, for um, Ben and Paul. Can we get uh, more current actual consumption numbers that we can, um, so, you know, cover <laughs> private info that we could get a more accurate estimate of San Quentin's consumption. Anyway, um, it's a question, it's yeah. a question. You don't have to answer it right now. So the thing that's intriguing about that is it's a relatively low capital cost. And I'm, I'm wondering whether that capital cost includes the capital cost San Quentin to, to double plumb their system or whether that would even need to be done. It, it does need to be done and it, it did include it. It is in the 10 million that is included. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, that's pretty intriguing. And then one other question on Peacock Gap. That estimates based on Peacock Gap's uh, summer consumption or whatever reasonable estimate you use. It's seasonal though, correct? Correct. Uh, so um, it's basically um, both um, CMSA and Peacock Gap are mostly irrigation. Uh, the, as for the uh, San Quentin, there is toilet flush and other things. So uh, it's not as seasonal as Peacock Gap, but um, right. golf course irrigation is highly seasonal. I think yeah. Yeah, there is going and to be a, go ahead. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, okay, there sorry. Is, yeah uh, there is going to be a sort of a, um, both benefit of it and the uh, uh, drawback of it. Um, benefit is yeah, wastewater continues to flow and in summer when they want the um, water and then they really want water, um, wastewater is still available. But um, on the other side um, is that the, uh, the um, again, um, really uh, the water that we need to provide um, when the, uh, I think the, um, on the 166 um, and it's still you know quite a high uh, quite high cost per acre foot and is it going to be the um, uh, making sense um, why well, do you think yeah, this this part is yeah already already going in so um it is going to go in but um it is going to be implemented but um on the overall picture when it is seasonal how much of contribution that can make to the overall water balance that is going to be something to think about right and then i guess brought up is that production could be somewhat seasonal too mm -hmm. depending on how much wastewater is generated so that's another interesting little right. variable that we would need to work into it and then my last question is with Peacock Gap or CMSA, uh, either one, that would provide a, a node, a distribution node from which we could arguably or uh, potentially build out another purple pipe district like was done up in, in uh, Terrell and, and, Mar and Marinwood. Yes, so for the Peacock Gap, uh, the assumption is to start from the uh, the uh, end of existing purple pipe and expand it to the uh, Peacock Gap um, area. And the, uh, the current study, I believe, is yeah, looking into both um, uh, sending it through the bay and through, sending through the, uh, the south side of the, um, that part of the uh, area land. And the, uh, my understanding is currently the, um, the team is looking through the, uh, um, through the land um, on the south route, and that's the assumption. Yeah, well, my, my question was, assuming we make the connection to Peacock Gap, mm -hmm. could we then extend the system down Point San Pedro Road into Central San Rafael into various other destinations? I believe so. Um, and it's, I think, yeah, um, it's the uh, demand supply balance, um, the, uh, Las Gainas Valley's uh, treatment plant, plant is the yeah, 5 NGD. And ag again, yeah, as you said, it's a seasonal. So even if it is yeah, in acre foot per year, 166, the um, max month demand may be uh, a lot higher. And can you make that demand met with the uh, um, current distribution system and current treatment system? That is something to be yeah. further evaluated. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. I also think you have to evaluate the city of San Rafael's acceptance of ripping up the streets. That's <laughs> why the, the process slowed down before. That's why they didn't extend into, into the second uh, area. Yes. Also, uh, my recollection is El Paso is looking at primarily desalting their groundwater. And I looked it up on the internet while we were on here. That's what I'm seeing. Uh, I don't see them doing much on DPR. I think they pretty much put all their eggs in one basket, which is to mm. take the salty groundwater and desalt it. And they've actually built those facilities. Um, there, there's a problem with getting rid of the salt, but they're working on that too. But anyway, that's my understanding. 
<clears throat> they built that's this new Bailey Hutchinson facility that's been running for many years, and I think they would have expanded, but disposing of the concentrate deep wells has been problematic. Yes. Can I ask one more question about the cost estimates, not just for this option, a set of options, I should say. Um, how I assume that um, these cost estimates all include some estimate of energy use and cost. Yes. Yes. Is yes. that something that you can um, break out for us? I think that would be um, of interest to um, the board and I expect the staff and the public. Uh, not that I want you, I understand that these are high level costs, mm -hmm. but I think having a sense of the different um, energy impacts of each of them would be another relevant factor. Yeah, yeah, good, um, good request. And in the evaluation criteria, one of the criteria that we have is, is energy usage. So we will be showing that, that separately as well. Okay, thanks. And, and Jim, isn't it at least half the cost on the dollars per acre foot is energy, if not Bay more? For Baywater desal? Yeah. Yeah, it's usually around 35 to 40 percent. Yeah. I, I, I just meant for all the options. I don't. Right. I, I don't think, Larry, you weren't suggesting that that's the case for all of these different options, are you? Uh, pretty high energy. Um, okay. well, I one think of that's the things that, to pull it out. Well, one of the things that gets interesting about CSMA is, uh, although I've gotten a lot of pushback from Jason Dow about this, is it seems to me that. Um, and I don't know how much impact it really has, but their TDS is running about 2,500 plus. Um, and it seems to me that infiltration inflow control would be very valuable there to bring their TDS down to half of that number or something like that. Um, although they haven't expressed much interest. So that's something you should keep in mind too, though. There is potential. The, most of the salt intrusion comes into the pipelines that are along the freeway as I understand it, because everything else is higher than that. So yeah, that is a very good point. There. Yeah, um, many of the um, Bay Area's um, uh, non-portable reuse scheme is having, um, having this uh, challenge that um, leaky uh, sewer pipe is yeah, raising the um, uh, TDS um, in East Bay Mud. Um, I think yeah, in summertime when there's yeah, less uh, Rainwater but or the uh, groundwater, yeah. yeah, it gets the um, the TDS really uh, skyrockets, and yeah. in winter time TDS goes down, and the um, so the um, East Bay Mount is currently doing the study to partially treat with the uh, reverse osmosis to lower the TDS to be able to use for non-portable purple pipe scheme. So uh, I think yeah, that's a very good point that uh, we probably need to uh, consider in the uh, evaluation. There's been a lot of really great questions. I don't. I know we've, I'm, that Armin's already trying to usher us along, rightly so, probably. Um, just one thought about the the in the the concept of of recycled water at, contributions to our to Lagunitas Creek is just a concern about can we can the water really be treated to the degree where we are not contributing um, really hard to remove. Um, you know, endocrine disruptor, you know, chemicals that are, are, you know, very, very, very small. And, and, and I think are troublesome. I don't know about the current technology to be able to remove things that are in our, our water, but I think that's going to be a, something that should be addressed in our, in the write-up. If, and if there's any thoughts about it now, that would be great. Yeah, and that was one of the uh, you know many <laughs> reasonings that uh, we are forwarding in the uh, in the um, stream flow to the uh, IPR. Um, it just yeah, doesn't seem to make sense to just do the uh, tertiary treatment and try to discharge it to the uh, stream flow that is um, currently receiving very clean water. No, but I I'm the one that originated the concept, and uh, the plan was to to membrane treated mm -hmm. decent, yep. Yep. you know so and i think you can pretty well assume monty that the endocrine disruptors would be removed by the membranes uh yes uh so the um ipr um process is going to remove a part of it by membrane and a part of it by uh um advanced oxidation <laughs> yes and the, uh, for DPR, uh, it actually uh, includes the uh, ozone BAC as well. That also removes more. One thing that may um, come up as a uh, sort of public's interest is the uh, PFAS um, 
and that doesn't necessarily get removed. Uh, the re uh, reverse osmosis removes it really well, so um, that shouldn't be a problem. But um, uh, advanced oxidation itself doesn't really remove the uh, PFAS, so you have to go through the uh, membrane. I don't think we have much source of PFAS that I'm aware of anyway in our in our wastewater. Yeah, I'm going to move us on here if, if uh, the board is okay with it in order to get through all of the alternatives. Really good discussion on reuse, and we'll have more of that on the 12th as well. President Russell, I'm, you tell me if we're moving too fast, but I'm trying to get through. So, No, I don't, I don't think so, Armand. We're, we're fine. Okay. Have at it. We'll, we'll recycle you if we need to put you back. And have recycle the spot. Okay, excellent. Uh, all right, well, the next set of options, uh, let's see, uh, Marcelo, you, are you with us? We'll walk through the local storage augmentation and I'll grab the last one. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Armin. So for the local storage augmentation, right, we have uh, three options here that we're looking at. Uh, the raising of the Sulahuli Dam, the dredging of the Nicasio Lake to create a little bit of storage and movable spillway gates. Those are the three that we'll be looking here. Next slides. But first I wanna give you an idea, is that an opportunity to uh, increase the storage in the system? And uh, one way here that we thought about showing you, okay, well, what is the size of the opportunity is to present these bar charts where the, the blue uh, the blue bar is representing the storage, the current storage that you have for each one of your, uh, your lakes, your, your reservoirs. And, uh, and the gray area is an average of spills from these reservoirs. So for example, Nicasio and Sulahuli, uh, Nicasio on average is spilling 20,000 acre feet of water per year. So just, just to give an idea that uh, there is some opportunity in the magnitude of that opportunity. Just a reminder that the last uh, uh, storage expansion happened in the 80s on the Kent Lake when it went from uh, 16,000 acre feet to 30, a little bit short of 33,000 acre feet on the Kent Lake. There's some, some, still some opportunity. So the first one on the next slide would be the Sulahuli. And uh, there will be some interaction between Sulahuli and Nicasio uh, if we would uh, have the expansion of storage at that location. This was uh, one project that was identifying the water resources plan in 2040, uh, back in 2017, when they released the, the report, when we, you released the report. So uh, on that concept, the Sulahuli Dam would uh, increase by 48 feet, which is a, it's a good uh, size that you have to uh, increase the dam. The, the additional 20,000 acre feet of storage right, would, be, would be created. So on top of approximately 10,000 acre feet of storage that you have in Sulahuli, the potential yield of that extra storage would be around 4,000 acre feet per year. That how much, uh, on average, how much uh, water you would get of uh, a project of that uh, magnitude. Something to uh, consider here is the electrification of solar holy. Uh, as a reminder, uh, you don't have power there for the pumps to move water out of solar holy into your system and it will be to uh, Nicasio Reservoir. So this is uh, something to consider and uh, we are estimating some costs to include power uh, at Sulahuli uh, Dam. There's also uh, some considerations here on the dam, structural integrity, new uh, inundated areas and some uh, water rights uh, for, for, for the reservoir. So that's option one. Option two is the dredging of Nicasio Lake. Again, that, that was an option that was identifying the water resources plan 2040. So this would create about a thousand acre feet of uh, storage by dredging uh, areas of the Nicasio Reservoir. 
we're assuming that uh, because of sedimentation that will last about 10 years. That was uh, our uh, assumption here. And the challenges is the environmental problems that uh, the dredging could create when you start uh, moving the sediments and mobilizing potential contaminants that are in, uh, in the sediment. So something to keep in mind in that option too of the dredging of Nicasio. And the last one, I think Carmen will cover the raising of the spill gates. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Marcel. Nice job. Um, so the yeah the third option here that we're considering is the installation of movable spillway gates. Um, I'd say we're still a bit of work in progress on on building this uh, option out, but we've done some initial analysis of what an increase in one, two, three, four, or five feet of elevation at a spillway might create in terms of additional storage for select reservoirs. And that's the table that's, that's shown on the right here. Um, the idea here is that uh, spillway gates that would be movable um, during, during periods could be installed and operated and, and essentially build an uh, additional storage up behind the dam that, that wouldn't, wouldn't normally have been operable without those gates. Uh, we think that there's likely limited to three feet of increase, although some of this will depend on on permitting and, and core um, core permits. Um, this is similar to uh, an option that North Marin was looking at in terms of their uh, movable spillway gates at, at Lake Stafford. That's the picture in the upper right is actually the, the concept from, from Lake Stafford. Um, I think key considerations here are the adequacy of, of the spillway and dam. So not all of your spillways are um, have the same structure as Stafford. Stafford's actually quite quite unique in its concrete structure like that. Um, so the adequacy of both the spillway and the dam has also been um, uh, safety of dam inspections or um, on some of the dams. So um, further work needs to be done to characterize which would be the most pertinent or most opportunistic um, area to, to increase, uh, to look at this option. Uh, so just looking at the table to the right, though, you can see that um, it varies, obviously, the size of the lake, one, one foot, two foot, three foot, gives you different storage volumes. The largest storage volume you'd gain out of it is at Nicasio, um, but that may be a challenging uh, dam in order to adjust a, a spillway. Uh, what we've done in the analysis, we did an analysis for Alpine Lake and and use that for our, our analysis. We did not look at increasing movable gates on all of the spillways, but would uh, like to have that discussion on how to move forward with this alternative. Carmen, did you do a, um, or do, I should ask, <clears throat> do we have uh, an elevation storage curve for our reservoirs? Yes, so all the data that's shown here in this table is all derived from that, um, elevation area capacity curves for all the reservoirs. And many many of them were updated in 2017, uh, including the new sedimentation rates and estimates there. And um, oh, why don't you go ahead? I've got a couple other questions, but it's further on your presentation. Okay, sure. I, I think we're getting to the cost estimation on these. So happy to take questions as I go through this. Um, for the uh, raising of the Sulahuli uh, Dam, we use that estimate of 4,000 uh, 4, acre feet per year of additional yield, and the cost numbers that are shown here uh, at around $2,700 an acre foot of potential yield. On the dredging of Nicasio, just a caveat on the way the costing was done here was it was estimated that all the dredging was essentially a capital cost, and then uh, then there wasn't dredging beyond that. That's why the annual costs show up as as a as zero for for this particular one. Um, the estimating yield there is about a thousand acre feet per year. And then option three, the final one there, we've estimated for Alpine Alpine Lake, um, increase the cost estimates that were done for North Marin to reflect kind of a larger a larger spillway, different. Uh, type of operation 
these cost estimates certainly would be adjusted. Um, and then if you just, if you were to flip back at the previous one, it said uh, the previous slide showed about 700 acre feet of, a, of additional storage capacity would be gained at Alpine Lake with the three foot raise. Uh, we have not yet done the modeling analysis, but the yield number would be expected to be less than half of the total storage capacity that was gained. So back to Director Schmidt's comment at the very beginning, storage does not equal yield. We think it might even be less than this number. So that estimate on option three only includes the one facility at Alpine, correct? Correct, currently it's, it's a single facility. Okay. We probably need to do a little bit more. We, well, we absolutely do need to do more exploration on which other facilities would be likely candidates. Some we would probably exclude from this, this option, but we could build out multiple, um, multiple storage facilities and, and enlarge this option number three. So assuming we could do either Kent or Nicasio, that at, at a three foot level, that's, that's an increase of about 3,600 acre feet. If we went to five foot spillway gates, that would be an increase of about 61, 6,000 acre feet. So assuming we got about a 50% yield out of that, that would be about a 3,000 acre foot a year yield if, if those two projects were, were feasible, correct? Yeah, it, not not greater than that fifty percent yield for sure, and I, I think the five five foot um, a five foot gate might be a a real challenge to to get permitted. Okay, what's the impact uh, on the spill gate concept, particularly for the Lagunitas Creek uh, reservoirs? Uh, what's the impact of uh, State Water Resources Order ninety five? 17, which gives us mandatory release requirements. Yep, um, Director Gibson, we've not yet evaluated uh, either the inundation aspects of backing up more uh, more water behind the dam. Um, the releases would be identical to, um, to the existing uh, water rights, but you would also have to have a water right in order to hold additional storage, a wa uh, water right amendment likely. Yep. Yeah, I assume you made the same assumption about Sulahuli. We did. Okay. Yeah, I think it's it's probably worth flagging that 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 uh, especially you know it, it's it's like it, it it's a reasonable assumption that our release requirements would change um, because obviously we're storing more water. And we're reducing the amount of spills or the amount of water that does go down in the wintertime. It, it's, it seems unlikely that that the water board wouldn't um, look at our current operations and you know and seek to make sure that there's some level of release that's commensurate with the increase in storage. But just something to note. I know there's no way to predict it at this point. Right, but just my one comment is the. I'll call it the beauty of the spillway gate concept is its flexibility. So I think you could even argue that it could actually have a beneficial environmental impact because we'd have more water to spill when needed. So it's, it's, it's an intriguing concept and also another, another concept that is um, fairly low capital costs compared to some of the others that we're looking at. Yeah, I think you're making a good point that the, I was really more speaking about dam raising versus the, sp the spillway gate concept. Understood. Okay, I, I think we'll move on, I'm trying to read the room. So we'll move on to the <coughs> next category of, of options of Sonoma Marin partnerships. Um, so we have we have four different uh, options that are are being evaluated here. Uh, the first two involve um, trying to take greater maximizing use of Sonoma water. Um, the first one is maximizing use of Sonoma water in, in winter with existing facilities. The second one is really maximizing the use of of that winter water using dedicated conveyance through. Um, 
to Sukulawugi and Nicasio Reservoirs. Then groundwater well rehabilitation in, in the Santa Rosa Plain and a regional groundwater bank. And I'll walk through each of those in, in fairly quick fashion. Uh, the first one is really, we, we've laid it out there as existing conveyance limitations. So kind of your existing system, reflecting your improvements at, at Castania uh, pump station, but operating to maximize use of uh, Russian river water in winter. Um, when we think most of that opportunity is kind of December through March, or um, maybe a little bit in November through April as the shoulder seasons, but primarily December through March. Uh, we would want to maximize take uh, or use of Sonoma water up to 14.3, which is your contractual limit. And then in turn, reduce the use of your local water supply and store that water in your local reservoirs. So bolstering local storage through increased use of Sonoma water um, available supplies. Uh, we've used the existing bottle, uh, the bottlenecks at either Ignacio Pump Station, which are shown here. The Castania reflects the, the, the recent improvements. And then because this, this particular option brings water directly into the system and doesn't store water in a reservoir, it's limited to the winter demands in your system, which are approximately 14 MGD. So the, the limitation becomes kind of the winter demand capability. I know you still have some internal bottlenecks on your distribution system, but, but largely from a system standpoint, the, the winter demands are a limiting factor. I think a key part of this uh, option is how do we integrate this into a kind of integrated reservoir operational strategy? When would you actually want to maximize use of Sonoma water? And when would you want to back off on, on this use? So getting to a, an optimized balance of Marin and, and Sonoma water supplies that's dependent upon hydrology, storage, and, and demand is, is really key, kind of a key operational forecast capability. Uh, the picture on the right, for those who have not been out there, this is the, uh, the uh, two of the collectors, those housing, the green houses up there are two of the Russian River collectors that have the go down a hundred plus feet and have horizontal wells underneath the, or into the alluvium underneath the Russian River. It's also showing the, the, divert, the rubber diversion dam and the fish passage. So this is essentially how water is diverted from the Russian River through Sonoma Waters um, intakes or collectors. Uh, the second option, um, the second option doesn't have the full graphic listed there right now, but this would be um, an option to essentially take that winter water at and reduce any limitations on conveying that water. And now not just into your distribution system, but into uh, Sulahuli and Nicasio reservoirs. So we maximize use through that dedicated conveyance. There was a concept that was has been studied by Sonoma Water called the Southern uh, South Transmission System Pipeline, which would uh, alleviate any conveyance constraints between the Kotati tanks and the Castania. Um, that conveyance is included in this option. And then uh, pump station and conveyance to go between Stafford and Sulahuli and Nicasio. There's an existing uh, capability to move water from, from Stafford up, um, but it's fairly limited in its capacity and, and likely to take advantage of this kind of, what we call it like a big sip approach to, um, to diversion of water when it's available, would likely have to have a, a separate pump station. And then as with the other alternatives, uh, we, we included electrification of Sulahuli uh, for this one. Are you considering any possibility of a, a, an additional reservoir, non-creek reservoir to serve simply in this function? Uh, we have not at, up to this point, Director Gibson. Okay, should we? My, my first blush response would be when we look at the other storage options, the local storage options without this dedicated conveyance, we're gonna learn 
quite a bit more about the capability of excess system, uh, excess storage in the system. Mm -hmm. um, certainly additional storage, whether it's in, in district, in Marin Purvey or outside of Marin Purvey is, is valuable. So mm -hmm. um, we, we've not looked at that and we've not identified sites for additional storage. It's something we can take a look at moving forward though. Thank you. Uh, Armin, if, and, uh, Armin, Armin, sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Director Bergman. Just one, one quick note, Armin. Um, I, I think so. This is the use of winter water, and in particular, if we were referencing drought conditions, we would expect to have, I think, storage capacity in our reservoirs in those drought conditions. Yeah, for the uh, that's true, Paul. For the most part, we would we'd expect to have storage, um, storage there. There's always the the risk of putting water into storage is that you get a, a December storm like you did last December and you put the water in storage and you've spilled it. Having a, an off stream reservoir reduces that risk of spill, but, but correct. But correct. We, would, we would have capacity to initially put, store, uh, put the water into storage. And Armin also, you didn't list cost as a factor. The, um, Sonoma water is about twice as expensive as our treated water. So, you know, you listed out a, a variety of things of the trade-off between how do you balance between Sonoma water and Marin water. But th there's another factor, which is we're paying twice as much for their water as our water. So that has an impact too. Good point, thanks. It sure does. And as far as electrification, the last number I heard from PG&E uh, for Sulahuli was six million. Is is that the at cost estimate? That is the same cost estimate that we are using. Yeah, six million for the electrification improvements. Okay, I'll I'll keep moving to option three, which is. Um, supporting groundwater well rehabilitation, particularly in the Santa Rosa Plains. Sonoma Water operates uh, uh, three significant wells at the, in the Santa Rosa Plain. They also have wells that are at the intakes, actually groundwater wells at the intakes. But these are improvements at the Todd, Sebastopol, and Occidental wells in, in the Santa Rosa Plain. This is water that gets pumped into uh, the transmission system and is available to all customers. Uh, they've received uh, seven seven million dollars, I believe, in in, uh, in grant funding to to augment or rehabilitate some of these wells. I know there's a push to convert some of them to ASR opportunities, but this has a is a relatively low risk new yield uh, new yield or rehabilitated yield. I guess would be a better way to describe it, um, and could provide a more reliable delivery to uh, Marin. Uh, the fourth option is the regional groundwater bank. And th this is at very much at concept level exploration phase, but the concept here that's being discussed is uh, ASR wells, aquifer storage and recovery wells. So wells that could be put water in and take water out of Santa Rosa Plain, Sonoma Valley, and Petaluma Valley groundwater basins. Uh, these wells could either through in lieu exchanges or direct movement of water through the transmission system, store water and, and then take water out. So uh, Director Gibson, your comment on storage, this, this could be another opportunity for storage um, similar to uh, an off-stream storage facility. Um, obviously, there are um, the delivery could be direct or in lieu exchanges, and there are lots of considerations. So certainly, this is not an easy project to implement because of the agreements that would have to occur. There are groundwater sustainability agencies that have GS, GSPs, groundwater sustainability plans that are being developed. Um, alignment with the benefits for all the overlying users and exchange agreements would have to be developed. Um, but I think there is a common at least from my my read of the, the table, it's, there seems to be a, a common uh, desire to at least explore what a, a regional groundwater bank would look like amongst many parties in, 
in the region. Yeah. Uh, and then finally to, to the cost, um, cost tables for, for these options. Uh, we have the costs here from the first one, option one, we've uh, assumed no, no change in the basic cost of uh, purchase of Sonoma water because this is truly an operational adjustment rather than a, uh, than a new facility that's being implemented. There is the risk of, of filling in and then spilling this water, which if you accounted for the spill, then would actually increase the cost associated with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a kind of a risk cost trade-off. Uh, the dedicated conveyance has you know, substantial infrastructure that would need to be um, um, built here. Uh, there's there's um, uh, some refinement that needs to be done on, on these uh, de dedicated conveyance. We're just pulling out these alignments right now. Uh, the rehabilitation of Sonoma Wells would likely be a shared cost amongst multiple parties and we've estimated only a portion of that yield would be available, would actually benefit Marin. And then the regional, regional groundwater bank is, as I mentioned, is very much kind of a conceptual level uh, development at this phase. But, but I think many of, these many of these options produce lower, relatively lower cost uh, yield and, and substantial yields that we expect. The maximizing use of winter water be potentially 5,000 acre feet through just kind of operational improvements and, and changing a risk risk tolerance in your operations. Uh, the dedicated conveyance would really take advantage of that slugs of wet wet water and we, we're estimating up to 8,000 acre feet of potential yield. That's to be confirmed. There's still some modeling that needs to be prepared. Uh, I'll jump in with a question here. Armin, you, you're, um, uh, how do you arrive at the, for the option number four at a, a yield of 3,000 acre feet? I'm, I'm surprised that the number isn't, isn't larger, but um, just given that, it, that it's, uh, given the relative amount of storage that might be available. But I know, that, of course, there's so many assumptions about how things would be shared with, with, you know, other users and beneficiaries in the region and stuff, but just curious how you came at that number. Yeah, I'd say there's lots of uncertainty around that number. We've, we've uh, estimated that kind of a size of a bank would be somewhere around 20,000 acre feet to make it viable and um, for, for the parties at play. And so the 3,000 is, is the assumed Marin portion of that 20,000 acre feet. So that, that'd be a 3,000 acre feet yield of just for Marin. Would be, other parties would be benefiting at similar levels. What is it? What it, 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 you, so you assumed a minimum 20,000 acre foot um, volume as a minimum project. Do you, uh, do you have a, an estimate of what is an upper, you know, uh, viable amount of storage in, in groundwater? space that you know if, if the project if, if interest in the region wanted to go for something larger than 20,000 acre feet is there some sort of considered viable range well the estimates right now from that i've understood from the gsps are lower than that 20,000 that so the 20,000 actually would be higher than what their current estimates are okay much of the much of the limiting factor is is available storage because of high groundwater levels in a number number of those basins. So, in order to get to twenty thousand or larger, would be kind of more proactively managing the groundwater basins, creating creating essentially pools to to store water. Um, so it, it would require kind of collective management of the groundwater basins at something different than what is uh, there today. That's helpful. Thank you. Can I ask you? That? Do you have a sense of timing on that, Armin? I know that um, there have been conversations for many years, maybe the whole time I've been on the board, um, and a lot of interest. I'm sorry, I'm talking about option four in particular um, mm -hmm. on regional groundwater banking with Sonoma. But I keep hearing different things about um, timing. Do you have an estimate on that, just to put it, that in context with some of the other options that have been presented? I can't give you a, 
a very precise one, but I would, I, mean, I think with the GSPs being out now, that sets kind of a, a boundary of, and many of the actions that those GSPs are looking for are ASR type opportunities. So I think there's a collective desire to move forward in some capacity. Um, so going back to the timing, I would say no earlier than five, five to seven years. We worked on a on a very large conjunctive use program in Southern California, and, and even when all the parties had agreed, it, it was still a you know three to five year process. Got so. it. So so these are current dollars that you're obviously um, okay. Got it. All right, that's that's helpful. And I have to say, these numbers in terms of cost per acre foot. Are, are very consistent with what I think we've seen before. Are you, is that is that consistent with your sense of it? I mean, this seems to be one set of options where, um, you know, we're not seeing a very large increase in, um, in costs compared to prior estimates. Yeah, I can't speak to the prior estimates, but they're, I think these ones are, are somewhat easier to to cost as well some of the really complex infrastructure ones have a lot more uncertainty around them yeah, yeah. okay thanks along the same line as Cynthia was commentating there uh, is, uh, uh, is there any way to break all of these options out perhaps at the end of the day here uh, into those that we would characterize as short short-term projects emergency projects versus those that are really long-term projects because uh, the, they're really a two different set of categories that we're trying to analyze here. Yeah, very, very good point, Director Gibson. I, I think that the roadmap is essentially going to pull that stuff, that uh, information together. What can be implemented for near-term droughts? What it accomplished for longer droughts? And then what preemptive actions might you take before a drought occurs? And which ones do you take during the, the early phases of the drought and then the longer phases of the drought? That, that's something we're very keen on, on implementing, not just which options are, are useful, but I think how to use the options in the most effective way. Mm -hmm. I just have one quick question about the groundwater basins in Sonoma. And the question is whether or not there are agricultural um, irrigation wells that are currently drawing water from those basins? Uh, the answer is yes. I don't know the full quantity of, of that in Santa Rosa Plain in particular. Um, and there's also domestic domestic wells out there that are that are using cruising groundwater basins. So and, yep. and certainly Petaluma, Petaluma's basin is being used for irrigation as well, correct? Correct, and, and the city of Petaluma is, has wells in, for themselves as, as well, no pun intended. So, so that, may, that might affect capacity and yield um, when those numbers are, are factored into it. Correct? Correct. Correct, yeah. And keep in mind, there are also water quality issues. Uh, TCE under the HP facility and um, I, in 1970s, I did an evaluation for Rohnert Park about their wells, which had very high boron levels and required substantial treatment to be usable. So there are, depending on where you are, it can have a big impact on the water quality. Yeah, ar arsenic is arsenic treatment mm -hmm. on a number of the wells in, uh, in Valley of the Moon and Windsor is what I understand as they rehabilitate, they're having to put uh, treatment on them. Okay. Okay. I, we're almost there. Thank you for sticking <laughs> with us. The last category for today, at least, is um, water purchases with the uh, bay in, conveyance through bay inner ties. Um, we have we have really two two uh, or three categories of options. Uh, one is kind of the the bay inner ties from East Bay from either East Bay Mud or Contra Costa. These would be, in all of these, this is water purchased from outside the region, likely uh, Sac Sacramento Valley purchases from either Yuba or Feather River service area, um, water right holders, willing sellers. And these would be opportunistically purchased in, in 
in drought years or years leading into drought, de depending on the triggers we define. Uh, we have two that would involve moving a water across the across the bridge, um, either either a purchase from East Bay Mud or from Contra Costa, or through through East Bay Mud or through Contra Costa system. And then we've also looked at the uh, extension of a uh, intertide from North Bay Aqueduct. And then the, the last one, the inner tie across the Golden Gate Bridge with SFPUC, it's listed here, but we don't have uh, cost estimates yet. We're still in progress on, on building that out. Um, in all of them, I think it's important to recognize there's a purchase cost. There's a, a movement. If it's a Sac Valley purchase, it's a movement of that water across the Delta, which involves a loss of of water, termed carriage water, to maintain salinity in the delta. So on the order of 20 to 35 percent potential um, loss of that water um, in movement across the delta. And then there's a potential wheeling cost, depending on which, uh, which other agency is, is moving the water to the, to the inner tie. Uh, we've We've largely built, um, taken the cost estimates or the infrastructure estimates from, from the East Bay Mud uh, connection that you're, you're currently studying or studied in the past. Um, that's the pipeline to connect across the San Rafael Bridge and then tie in at near the CMSA location with the, the Richmond distribution system improvements and pump station. Uh, we could either connect to Contra Costa rather than East Bay Mud. We've, um, let me see, I lost my notes there. Okay, yeah, and obviously the permitting requirements are are challenging and your your team is is kind of in process of, of working through those permitting processes. Um, the North Bay Aqueduct inner tie would, would uh, connect through North Bay, um, largely from the Napa treatment plant there. And there's two options that we're uh, considering right now. We have considered the pipeline all the way to connect into um, into Marin system. There is the potential to to shorten that pipeline and and look at um, connecting to uh, the city of Sonoma and and then tying into the aqueduct system from there through an exchange. Uh, then the last one, option four, was the San Francisco PUC inner tie, which I mentioned we're not not yet ready to present. Uh, the cost numbers are shown here. Uh, the the inner tie connection with East Bay Mud ends up being the lowest cost of these options. Um, substantial costs associated with the longer conveyance and the higher pumping costs with associated with both an, a Contra Costa connection and a North Bay Aqueduct uh, connection. Just for point of reference, Armin, the last time I discussed this with Michael Carlin about coming across the bridge, he told me for $100 million, they'd bring a line across the bridge for us. So that's a, at least a ballpark reference. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm still trying to read the room. Um, so I'm gonna move us on to next steps. Um, so what we've presented today, first off is was meant to be kind of a high level overview. You'll uh, have the opportunity to talk with the folks who know this um, the yeah. best in more detail on July 12th for uh, desal and, and reuse, and then the other options on July 19th. Uh, so we're still working on building out some of these alternatives, cost and other evaluation criteria. I think the second bullet here is really important is that we're We've identified kind of the potential yield numbers that they provide as, as supply into the system. But what we really want, want and need to do is how do we take that yield and, and make it into a, 
into a dry year drought benefit. And that's really the, the challenge. So how you operate the system is with the new supplies is really important. Um, and with virtually all of the supplies, building a structure for a, a forecast-based decision-making on integrating and optimizing, optimizing those supplies is, uh, is of critical importance. And we're working through kind of a, a methodology that we can start to build, build that out in the modeling space. And then finally, we're uh, doing the additional evaluation criteria, which we will bring back to you in August to look at all of the alternatives. And while we shared the cost estimates with you today, there are about 10 other criteria that are of importance that we're also characterizing. And then just uh, look ahead for the, the next meeting. Again, it's July 12th on desal and, and recycled water options, July 19th on the remainder of the options. And then we'll move into the August, um, the August meetings. We'll have a, a public workshop, TBD late, probably late July, and then a, another one in late August as we work through each of these elements with the, the board. And with that, we are eight minutes short of two hours. So <laughs> that was a long one. Thanks for sticking with us. Paul and Ben and team, happy to take any, any questions. There's still energy to ask them. <laughs> oh, I can guarantee you there's energy. That's not the issue. <laughs> we we, we do any need space for public comments, right? Public questions as well. Yes, yes, yes which maybe makes the most sense it being the boards had a pretty good shot at asking their questions, unless there's something burning in somebody's craw at this moment. I have one question, as long as you're uh, inviting, what, what is the reason for the water loss uh, across the Delta? Yeah, um, whenever you're moving water across the Delta, and it's in what they call balance conditions means they're managing for salinity control. So some, whenever you export water out, you need to provide some increment of additional outflow to keep the salinity at bay. Okay. And so that's, that's that loss. It's called, we call it carriage water, basically the amount of water that needs to carry an acre foot across the Delta and keep the okay. salinity consistent. Okay. Good answer. Thanks a lot. Okay, how about public comment? Yes, so you're gonna okay. We have um, five co public comments at this time. We have uh, five speakers with their hands raised. Um, so, Mr. Jameson, I'm gonna go ahead and enable your microphone permissions. If you can just unmute yourself, I can yes. start the timer. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. I'd like to assure that the present study reflects the following restrictions about a pipeline to East Bay mud adopted by its board on December 14th. First, that any use of a pipeline shall be restricted to use only in a declared emergency, including its use as a normal supply of water. Second, that the use shall be for indoor use and firefighting only, about 8 MGP, requiring that we allow most of Marin's landscaping to die. This condition suggests that we could get, say, 4 MGD from Sonoma, East Bay mud, might, might only supply us with four MGD, not eight MGD. East Bay Mud's November 23rd planning meeting confirmed by MMWD explicitly capped usage at the eight MGD level, well below our pipeline's design capacity of 13.5 MGD. And third, that MMWD must participate in East Bay Mud's low income subsidy programs for its 1.4 million users, including the city of Oakland. These conditions adopted by East Bay Mud's Board of on December 14th assure that such a $100 million pipeline would be a financial fiasco and not a reliable source of water. And as the 2017 study did, any evaluation of regional desal must include such costs, which have increased from about 75 million in the 2017 study to $100 million now. The 2017 study estimated regional desal costs as comparatively unaffordable at, at $4,500 an acre foot, but now you're estimating only $2,500. So I'm wondering if you perhaps missed something in your cost assumptions. The North Bay pipeline would be even more expensive than only two or three months ago. Sonoma indicated it had no interest in regional desal plant. And I continue to be concerned that if your modeling suggests a shortage of only four to 8,000 acre feet annually, 
in a prolonged drought, I believe your model may be replicating the mistakes of the 2017 model's prediction that we can survive a six year drought with conservation only being required in year five. I believe your stress tests are nowhere near severe enough and certainly don't seem to take into account the terror we experienced just last summer and fall. I just have to comment that I'm stunned at the estimate that a five MGD plant here in San Rafael could cost, and this is D cell, could cost 357 million rather than last fall's estimate of about 162 million. Apparently the cost estimate has more than doubled since last fall. Thank you for your attention. Next, we have Phil Sauter. Mr. Sauter, I've uh, enabled your microphone permissions. Uh, thanks. Uh, first, congratulations to staff and Jacobs for a comprehensive look at ways to increase water supply. It's good we're doing this during these few golden months when our reservoir levels are sitting mm -hmm. right on average. My one disappointment is that while conservation is listed as an alternative, it wasn't addressed at all. I recall a few months ago when we did the turf analysis for delaying releases into the San Geronimo Creek, we went mile by mile and red by red to figure out how much less water the fish could endure without dying off. I hoped at that time and still hope for a similar analysis for human use. Are there any uses we could get by without? How many of our heavy water uses could, users could be taken care of with a small non-potable distribution system? I saw a recent projection that we could go from 115 gallons per day to 106 over the next 25 years, but do we know how many customers have already done that? I believe a decade ago, San Geronimo Valley users were using around 90 gallons per day, and I'm guessing we're using less now. We know that Director Russell and I are using around 30 gallons a day, but are there any others? Do we know how many district customers are matching Santa Cruz in terms of conservation? Do we know how they're doing it? What if it turns out that half the district's customers are already using 40% less water than 115? Do we owe them the same consideration we offer those who want more water? Do we think the state is going to be okay with our goal of 106 gallons per day in 2045? Are we being realistic when we seek to add 5 million gallons to our daily consumption? Are we always going to have intertie partners who are willing and able to sell us their excess water? I'd like to ask that in future iterations, we focus on conservation and identify any limiting factors and what stands in the way of Marin becoming a national example, a national example for water conservation. Uh, if I have 30 more seconds, I'll share a personal uh, story. 10 years ago, my 30 gallons a day cost me 180 for the year or 1.6 cents a gallon. Last year, my 30 gallons a day cost me $540 for the year or 4.99 cents, triple the amount. I'm not complaining because a nickel a gallon is still a good deal for Marin quality water. I point this out because projects like desal tend to add disproportionately, disproportionately to fixed costs, which everybody pays, and therefore it's a poke in the eye to those who try to conserve. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Brian D. Yes, hi, good evening, everybody. Um, two questions. One is, uh, what would be the acre foot yield benefit and cost if we were to combine some of these projects? Example, the Sonoma Marin, Par Sonoma Marin Partnership of Option 1 for maximizing winter water combination, combining it with uh, raising uh, uh, Saluji and or uh, Nicasio and or the movable spillways at those two. Um, from a sustainability and ecological perspective, I would, um, you know, venture to guess that this, well, I think by the numbers, it was less than half of the desal, but it's really focusing on maximizing what we have instead of just installing new technology that is a significant power consumer. Um, so where and how can we potentially combine some of these options um, to achieve the goal instead of just looking at each option individually? Uh, second is in um, uh, the building of the 1B Peacock Gap. Could MMWD and Lagunius um, potentially provide the same um, purple pipe uh, reusable water to some of the Nevada golf courses, which geographically are much closer to them. Um, and then Nevada uh, Water District provide the same acre foot water back to MMWD from their respective Russian River water allocations. 
again, I'm not sure how that all works on your guys' end, but it makes sense that if we're going to do something like just water our golf courses, we try to maximize the water on those golf courses around Marin in general, and then just provide the water back and forth between the Russian River allocations. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to have Sharice, before you go on, I just want to say very quickly, I want to agree with the prior speaker about the idea of mixing and matching um, options. I just want to put that out there because I actually have to go. I had a hard stop and I apologize to the other members of the public that I cannot um, stay and hear your comments, but I, I am late for another call. So I just want to thank everybody for participating and I apologize for having <clears throat> early. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Larry Minikis. Mr. Minikis, if you could please uh, unmute yourself. Oh, gee, I'm going to miss Cynthia. Um, Armin, thank you and your staff for, for these are incredibly complex issues and um, really appreciate all the information tonight. Uh, I think a, n a number of the board, and I can speak as well, are quite surprised at the high capital costs that were presented for both um, desalination and water reuse options. Um, one thing I would like to ask, or at least have consideration for is, when you talk about um, replacing the membranes at five-year intervals, I, I don't think the public recognizes what that means, that these filters and membranes can run into the tens of millions if I am correct and that these costs should be factored in every year because it's coming up and it, it's, it's a big dollar amount to maintain uh, these facilities. Uh, also under the options, and I'll try to be really focused here, uh, exploring the gates as, as uh, Director Bragman was saying, does make sense um, uh, due to the low capital cost, but you've also got to consider as um, I believe Armin was touching upon, or one of the staff is, uh, re there may be reinforcement costs involved. Um, the board probably knows Alpine Dam has been raised or built over three times. So um, th this has happened in the past. This is not something new, but with each time you've got to look at, at these ad added costs. Uh, also the Sonoma Well Rehab Project seems to be uh, something that should be uh, focused on as that seems realistic. It seems uh, uh, within budget and um, unless we have problems with uh, pollution, uh, toxics, um, it could be a good option. The groundwater bank, uh, that sounds good, but it seems off in the distance somewhere. And with that, I wanna thank you again and good evening. Thank you, Mr. Minikin. Thank you, Larry. And your numbers are probably accurate on the 10 million. That probably is that kind of number for the membranes. And the last speaker we have is 1402. Uh, J James Holmes, Larkspur. I, uh, I guess my question and comment would be, uh, I was surprised that there was not as much consideration in, with regard to local storage augmentation given to uh, the possibility of new reservoirs. I wonder why that was not considered. I certainly would uh, agree with uh, board member Gibson that this should be considered both uh, uh, on-site and off-site uh, reservoirs. And uh, if the reason for not considering new reservoirs was state order 95-17, then I believe that, that the option of contesting and revising that order should be considered, especially in light of the fact that another agency than the Water Board is mandating us to have enormous numbers of housing and to locate additional water supplies to uh, service that housing. And therefore, we seem to have two state agencies with uh, contrasting uh, policies. And uh, certainly, this would be a good time to invoke the demands of the, uh, of the um, state agencies demanding more housing as a defense to the state order by the water board restricting our water. So again, uh, uh, please expand the options to consider more uh, storage, uh, more local storage and the cre creation of additional reservoirs. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time we have no, no further speakers. Okay. Well, um, 
I think you guys did a great job, Armin and Jim and uh, Ryu Hero. Um, it was a very interesting presentation. Uh, we appreciate it. And with that, I think we'll call it a day. Thanks a lot, everybody. Okay, thank, thank you all. Thank you, folks. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.